Hello, my name is Tracy McGregor. I'm an instructor with EMS University. I've been instructing CPR for about four years, and I've been a nationally registered EMT since 2005. I've also been involved with the fire and EMS system for about 14 years. Today we're going to discuss lesson 4-4-2, strokes and CVAs. <clears throat> Let's begin. <clears throat> A cerebrovascular accident, also known as a CVA, is a sudden interruption of blood flow to the brain that results in neurological deficit. With a lack of oxygen, brain cells begin to die and ischemia will set in and cells that have not perished will not function properly. A CVA has similarities to a heart attack and that time is of the essence, which we'll discuss later in the slideshow. A stroke is a true emergency and recognition is key. Rapid assessment and transportation on the BLS level are imperative. There is typically a three hour window from the onset of symptoms to fibroanalytic therapy. They say with fibroanalytic therapy, typically known as clot busters, that this can greatly increase the chance of rehabilitation and reduce morbidity rate in strokes. The reason why they say rapid assessment and transportation is very important is very obvious. However, many patients are known to ignore these types of symptoms and wait to see if everything goes away. <clears throat> we'll discuss the symptoms here briefly. However, as an EMT, you need to be able to recognize these types of symptoms because there is a chance that the patient has waited a prolonged period of time and as I said just a second ago, there is that three hour window. Some of the risk factors for CVAs are hypertension, diabetes, arteriosclerosis, hyperlipidema, polycythemia, and cardiac disease. As we look at the diagram provided below, you will see some lifestyle risk factors which can also greatly enhance the possibility of a CVA. High fat diet, elevated blood pressure, inactivity, smoking, diabetes, and high cholesterol can all lead to heart disease and ultimately lead to a stroke. <clears throat> Typical signs and symptoms of a CVA is weakness, altered level of consciousness, dizziness or vertigo, visual disturbances, facial numbness, headache, convulsions, incontinence, dysteria, which is slurred speech, dysphagia, which is difficulty speaking, aphasia, which is loss of speech, hemiparesis, which is weakness on one side of the body, and hemiphalasia, which is paralysis on one side of the body. And always keep in mind that these two will appear on the opposite side of the affected area of the brain. I'd also like to talk about the altered level of consciousness in this. Keep in mind that with, ischem with ischemia and uh, the uh, brain cells that are dying, the body's going to react differently and that patient is going to have the altered level of consciousness due to that. There are typically two <clears throat> types of a stroke, an ischemic and a hemorrhagic. For ischemic, you have cerebral thrombosis and a cerebral embolus, which fall into this category. A cerebral thrombosis is a clot formation in the brain. A cerebral embolus is a foreign body originating somewhere else and lodges within the brain. Now keep in mind, an ischemic stroke is from a blockage, which cuts off the blood flow. The cerebral hemorrhage is where hemorrhagic stroke comes into play. A hemorrhagic stroke are when blood vessels rupture causing increased pressure in the brain with subsequent brain damage. For cerebral thrombosis, most common types of CBAs are via cerebral thrombosis, which is 80 to 90 percent. This commonly occurs at night while the patient is awakening with an altered level of consciousness or loss of speech sensory or motor functions. 
These are where the Cincinnati Stroke Scale or the Los Angeles Stroke Scale come into play, which we'll discuss later in the slideshow. <clears throat> Some things to keep in mind if you're responding to these types of incidents, especially as a late night call, there's going to be a lot of panic going on in the home. There may be some family members who are still living at home or, um, or a spouse or anything of the sort, and they're going to be panicked as well as the patient. Try to maintain a level of poise and professionalism, keep your head on a swivel, and always remember your training. With these types of emergencies, headaches are not common with this type of CVA and is usually associated with a long history of vessel disease. Signs and symptoms are usually slow to develop. One of the things you can ascertain if there are um, additional family members present are your sample history and try to find out if you can as much as you can from that person, the OPQRST. For cerebral hemorrhages, Keep in mind, a cerebral hemorrhage is a hemorrhagic stroke. It's a vessel that is rupturing in the brain, so you're going to have roughly 10 to 20 percent of all CVAs or cerebral hemorrhages. This can occur anywhere in the cranial vault. Most common causes are cerebral aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, hypertension, and because of this uh, type of stroke, you have a 50 to 80 percent mortality rate. Commonly, this occurs during stress or uh, exertion. The presentation is often abrupt, and the patient will show signs of the Cushing's reflex triad. The Cushing's reflex triad involves hypertension, bradycardia, and Cheyenne Stokes respirations. Keep in mind, Cheyenne Stokes respirations can also be characterized as seesaw breathing or something you may see with a toddler or a child as belly breathing. A transient ischemic attack, or also known as a TIA, is also referred to as a mini stroke. A TIA is typically characterized by a partial blockage that eventually travels through, so t try to think of it as a traffic jam where something has to stop abruptly and eventually will carry on its travel. The symptoms usually last from roughly 24 to 72 hours and then resolve without a deficit. So you may have somebody who is complaining of hemiphalasia or hemiparesis and what they're going to do is they're going to have the same similar onset and symptoms of a typical CVA. They say that this is a precursor to a CVA with two years of an onset of a TIA. So what they're saying is within two years they typically have a CVA. With a mini stroke, you as a BLS provider cannot dictate whether or not it is a true CVA or just a TIA. So as always, treat it as such and provide for a CVA. <clears throat> In this, we have a diagram. First on the top is your cerebral hemorrhage. The hemorrhagic stroke is the cause of the stroke, where the blood vessel in the brain ruptures. And you can see what it's doing here, and it's also creating pressure onto the brain. If we look down, the cerebral thrombosis, which is one of your ischemic strokes, is uh, you have a clot in the brain. And, uh, if you look to the top right, you have a cerebral embolus as the cause of the stroke, which is also one of your characterized ischemic strokes. The clot is a foreign body which has originated somewhere else and has traveled up into that vessel and now is clogging it. Keep in mind that this can be anything from a tumor particle to a fatty deposit. If you look down, you'll see the compression as the cause of the stroke. Now we're going to discuss the EMT assessment as a BLS provider and treatment for the CVA patient. As with always, maintain BSI pro, uh, precautions and your scene safety. You can obtain your number of patients, which typically, typically will be one in a CVA emergency. You're going to gather your general impression of the patient. Does this patient look sick or not sick? You're going to conduct an initial assessment of the patient which you're going to look for all your signs and symptoms. You're going to gather your sample history and your OPQRST. 
maintain the ABCs as necessary, and perform oxygen therapy and ventilatory support if needed. Now, when they talk about ventilatory support, they were discussing rescue breathing, which for an adult is 12 to 20 per minute. You're going to conduct a pre-hospital screening, which is the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Screening Scale, Los Angeles Pre-Hospital Screening Scale, which falls into the FAST test. We're going to discuss this later in the slides. Continuing on with the assessment of a CBA patient, you're going to check the blood glucose and treat if needed. Some of the things to keep in mind are airway compromise. If the patient has airway compromise, do not perform, provide oral glucose. Allow an ALS provider to administer drugs as needed. <clears throat> You can patch first and make sure a thorough neuro exam is conducted prior. If a hemorrhagic CVA is present, sugar will access the site bringing necrosis and providing much increased oncotic pressure to the bleed, causing a greater swelling of the brain and increasing the stroke. Elevate the head 15 degrees to facilitate venous drainage if not contraindicated. That would be something like C-spine compromise. If the patient has C-spine compromise, you're going to manage the C-spine mobility and you're going to uh, prepare that patient for transport. You're going to provide rapid transport and you will notify the ER as soon as possible. If you are a BLS unit, consider an ALS intercept and consider a stroke center if local. If you can't um, obtain either of these, consider getting a helicopter transport and flying the patient out. For the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke screening, the slideshow doesn't have any of the actual um, diagrams for these, which I do apologize for because I've tried to um, insert them into the screen or the slideshow. However, getting it to save was a little harder than I was able to figure out. Um, okay, so with the pre-hospital sc um, stroke screening, the Cincinnati style makes it very simple. You have three things to look out for. Facial droop, arm drift, and speech. The way you can dictate whether this patient is potentially having a CVA is by looking at either normal or abnormal. For the facial droop test, <coughs> ask the patient to show his or her teeth or smile. When it's normal, both sides of the face will move equally, and for abnormal, one side of the face does not move as well as the other. For arm drift, ask the patient to close his or her eyes and hold the arms out with both palms up. For a normal patient, both arms will move the same, and both arms won't move. For an abnormal patient, one arm does not move, so they don't move in sync, and one arm will drift um, as a progression of time. For the speech, there's several catchphrases that um, go around the medical um, field, but if we're looking at the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke screening, you can have that, per, that patient say, the sky is blue in Cincinnati. For a normal patient, the patient will say it correctly. For an abnormal patient, that patient will either lack um, the ability to speak or they're going to have a slurred speech. Also, this extra bullet um, explains that when was the patient last known to be normal. This way, if you have a, um, a person who's with the patient, like a family member, try and find out when that person was acting normal last. Um, what that will do is that will kind of give a time frame for the ER um, when you're giving your, your transport um, information to the ER give them that information and that can kind of help them get their general idea so that they can provide fiber analytics. Any positive finding 
for the FAS as a positive stroke test and the patient should be taken to a stroke facility. If the T for time falls within three hours, as mentioned, check protocol pa uh, the protocols because the patient may qualify for clot busters. Here are a couple of slides. I tried to get them updated and a little bit more animated, unfortunately. As I said, some of these slides weren't saving. Once the stroke is identified in the field, time should be minimized on scene. This would be your typical load and go. Uh, essentially, you can think of it as a life-saving intervention by uh, managing your time. Typically, a dispatcher will provide information that will kind of cue you in to what's going on with that patient. When you begin your response, you can kind of gather your thoughts and figure out what you need to be cognizant of. So when you arrive on scene, you can do a quick assessment of the patient. Once you are led to believe that this could be a CBA or a TIA, get a rapid transport going immediately. Most interventions should be um, performed en route to the emergency room. And for BLS providers, that is typically oxygen therapy, um, respiratory support via rescue breathing, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation if needed. Time is the most important aspect of the exam due to the potential therapy, as mentioned above, and carefully assess uh, the patient due to the signs and symptoms, which may be very subtle. So some of the things you really need to keep an eye out for are obtaining your sample history and your OPQRST if you have that. Early detection and transport of the CBA TIA will have dramatic effects of the mortality and morbidity of the patient. Using this Cincinnati stroke scale, the EMT can quickly and accurately access the neurological status of the patient presenting the CBA TIA signs and symptoms and should transport rapidly to decrease the time for treatment. Thank you for your time. I hope this has helped you and good luck.